Uh, next person's tall. Keep it up here. No, no, no. It's fine. I'll do this. Do this. So Oddman's 2014, pretty life-changing for me. There was the speaker, he was right before the intermission. And Trey had really cajoled me into coming to this thing and I did not want to go. Who wants to hear a bunch of stories about history? But I thought he looked pretty cool in that vest, that tie. You may know him as your resident geologist. But honey, I'm gonna know him soon as my husband. And I met him that night. So please, everyone, please give the biggest round of applause to Miles Trayer. Hi. Uh, yeah, I don't have a better intro than that. Uh, as Lilia said, I am Odsalon's resident geologist, and she is my future wife, and both of those are amazing. Uh, and tonight, I'm going to talk about the struggle to understand Earth's inner structure. Before the turn of the 20th century, Earth's interior belonged to the poets. There were stories of gods pounding on anvils and the fires shooting up to create volcanoes, of giant catfish thrashing around and causing earthquakes, and of grieving parents and babies crying so hard that the earth above trembled. Basically, everything beneath our feet, there be dragons. Excellent. Even Isaac Newton couldn't really help this when he proposed his theory of gravity and he re realized that whatever was beneath our feet had to be more dense than any of the rocks he could find at Earth's surface. But as to what was down there and what it looked like, eh. And so Earth's inner structure basically remained dragons until the turn of the 20th century. <laughs> when engineers began to build machines that could measure earthquakes called seismometers, and scientists realized that the earthquake waves recorded by those machines were a complex language that if properly read could help reveal Earth's inner structure. And into this moment, stepped a personal hero of mine, an absolutely brilliant scientist, and a virtuoso scientific observer, Miss Inga Lehman. I love that, that's a cheer. Tonight, we are going to follow her journey of discovery. So in June of 1929, Miss Inga Lehman sat alone in a concrete bunker on the far western flank of Copenhagen, Denmark, and watched a needle bounce up and down on a piece of paper. Because what else were you going to do on a Tuesday? <laughs> that needle bouncing up and down was recording an earthquake that Miss Lehman couldn't even feel, but she jotted down the time and the intensity of the shaking. And in her barely legible scrawl, she started to calculate where the earthquake came from. And she said, ah, it must have been somewhere near New Zealand, almost exactly on the opposite side of the planet. And Lehman knew that earthquakes like this one, whose waves had to go through the entire planet, were our best bet to understand what was going on in Earth's interior. And she began to build on an idea, a theory that had been proposed just 20 years earlier. That theory largely belonged to this man, Richard Dixon Oldham, a fellow seismologist who had done a lot of observing of earthquake waves and noticed some odd behavior. So as he looked at earthquake waves, Oldham knew that there were different kinds of waves and that one particular kind of wave never seemed to show up on the other side of the planet. That was weird. 
in fact, it looked like they were being blocked by something. And I think Oldham's actual quote in his scientific paper was, this deserves future consideration. <laughs> to help explain what the hell was going on here, Dixon actually looked to a different theory, something called wave theory, that said what, what those waves were doing, those types of waves, shouldn't show up when they try to pass through liquids. They can't go through liquids. So that led Oldham to propose, mm, maybe Earth had some sort of liquid core. <laughs> and that certainly seemed like a neat idea, but it, it sort of seemingly ran counter to what Newton had said, right? Everything below our feet needed to be more dense, but liquids tend to be less dense than solids, so there were still some questions that needed to get answered here. And soon after Olden published this theory, many scientists, including Inga Lehmann, began to build mathematical models to sort of describe how earthquake waves would move through the planet. And as they did, they noticed that they would take some weird paths through this liquid outer core. And in fact, as they would travel through, scientists were able to identify this one weird region shown here in the gray, this one weird place where earthquake waves just wouldn't show up. And because geologists are great at naming things, they called it the shadow zone. <laughs> so this shadow zone was tremendously important. It was, again, this theoretical area where specific kinds of earthquake waves shouldn't ever show up. And if someone like, say, Inga Lehman, could prove that it existed, we would have a much better picture of what was going on in Earth's interior. So almost immediately, Lehman and her colleagues began just putting seismometers all over the planet. And that's what they really wanted to do. They wanted to understand what was going on. They called it the seismic network. And as they continued to build out this seismic network, they were trying to look for you know, any sort of behavior, any sort of patterns that would show up. And Lehman first started looking at this, and there was a problem. Those waves that weren't supposed to be there kept showing up in the shadow zone. And two of Lehman's closest colleagues, both giants in the field of seismology, and both men, by the way, couldn't explain what was going on. But they were also like, eh, we'll just sort of hand wave it away. Yeah, we don't need to really think about what's going on there. You know what? They're not really common. You know, they tend to show up near the edges of the shadow zone. And that can happen when your timing mechanisms are screwed up, or, you know, if your observations are wrong, or your, interpreta your interpretations must be wrong. You're just reading the wrong stuff off the seismograms. They can't really be there. <laughs> and Lehman didn't buy that. She trusted her observations. She thought something weird was going on here. So she checked her machines, checked the timing mechanisms on the machines, and waited for the next big earthquake. And waited. And waited. For years, until June 16th, 1929, when a huge earthquake hit New Zealand. Lehman immediately collected the records from her own seismometers, and she began to collect the records from the other seismometers, that global seismic network that she and her colleagues had built. And there on the records, clear as day, were the waves that weren't supposed to be there. Lehman knew this was important. She knew that this is something that could potentially overthrow this well-accepted theory. But in order for her to get taken seriously, she needed her own theory to explain what the hell was going on. As though I hadn't thought of that joke. It took her seven years to get it published, working almost entirely on her own. And there were two major reasons it took Ms. Lehman so long to get this theory published. The first was sexism. She was a woman, and science was, and still very much is, a male-dominated field, and it was just hard for her to get taken seriously. 
And the second reason, which is probably the only reason worse than sexism, was Nazis. <laughs> because now we're in the 1930s, right next to Germany, and things were tense. <laughs> And the rise of the Nazi party actually forced most of Lehman's closest colleagues, scientific colleagues and friends, to flee the region. But she stayed to maintain the seismic network. And in fact, she used the seismic network as her own form of resistance. During the war, Lehman realized that all of the bombs and artillery and tanks and all of that shook the earth like an earthquake. And she looked at those waves and was able to figure out where those waves were coming from. And then she published it in the scientific record, which allowed the allies to understand where the Nazi artillery was. And if you'll permit me to go a little long on this talk, there's another story that I just really want to share. So during the war, during the war, uh, Miss Lehman was unbelievably well respected. And in Copenhagen, people knew you couldn't really mess with her. She, she had that much clout. And so even when the Nazis invaded, they were like, uh, we don't want to mess with her. <laughs> Until one day they learned that Miss Lehman had been harboring a Jewish family in her home. And they said, well, that can't happen. So a Nazi commander came up and knocked on her door and demanded, turn the family over. And Miss Lehman spoke multiple languages at the time and returned in perfect German. And sorry, I have to read the screen to make sure I get the translation right. No. <laughs> and they walked away. <laughs> She's the best. <laughs> but back to her research. So finally, in 1936, Inga Lehman publishes her masterpiece. This is actually an original printing from 1936 that I was able to get my hands on and leaf through, and I was just like shakingly giddy when I had this thing. Um, and in its pages, she returned to those earthquake waves that weren't supposed to be there. And she reasoned that these waves had to be approaching Earth's surface at a steeper angle if they were going to show up in the shadow zone, sort of like this red line right here. And that meant that they had to be changing direction really sharply inside that liquid core, almost like they were bouncing off of something. She used her knowledge of physics to say, well, whatever that thing is, it's probably a solid. That's how something's going to bounce off of it. And using the location of where all those bounces were happening, she was able to estimate a rough size for this hidden object that no one had ever seen before. And she said, yeah, it's roughly the size of the moon. Lehman had discovered Earth's solid inner core. And in this absolutely magnificent piece of scientific research was the model of our planet that we're now all hopefully familiar with, with the crust, the mantle, the outer core, and the inner core. This is the first time this model ever showed up in the scientific literature. And it's the model that we're still teaching today. All right, I didn't think of that one. <laughs> yeah, that wins. Uh, <laughs> and the sad truth of, of all of this, because of course there's a sadness to it that I will redeem shortly, uh, is that I, I'd be willing to bet that when we all learned this model in school that we never learned her name. <laughs> and actually, to Miss Lehman, that would have been all right. She was never in it for the recognition. She never wanted the attention. She wasn't seeking the spotlight. She just wanted her science to work and for her science to be accepted. But this is the one and only time I feel like I can successfully disagree with her. We should remember her name. We should remember her contributions. And so I wanted to end tonight by talking about her legacy. 
when Inga Lehman proposed this theory, there were a lot of reasons it took her so long. I mentioned sexism and Nazis, but there was a third key reason. And that was that for all of her calculations, for all of her observations and all of this, we can't go down there and check. <laughs> the outer core starts 1,800 miles below our feet. The deepest we've ever drilled is seven and a half miles. That's not even through the crust. <laughs> so in order for her theory to be accepted, she had to use other theories and have everything support hers. And then her theory in turn had to support theories that followed. And that's exactly what happened. Her, her proposal of the solid inner core led uh, planetary scientists to talk, think about what's called planetary differentiation, how heavy elements tend to sink to the middle, elements like iron or radioactive elements that might cause a lot of heat and create a heat engine inside of our planet. And this explained why Earth isn't just a cold ball of rock orbiting the sun. That heat engine would then move out into the liquid outer core and it would cause that liquid iron to move around, sort of like water churning in a pot of boiling water. That moving iron would create a magnetic field and that helped explain Earth's magnetic field that protects all life from solar radiation. That heat keeps moving up and gets into the mantle and the mantle moves much more slowly and it begins to drag the crust along. And as it does that, it provided the working mechanism for the theory of plate tectonics that didn't show up until 40 years later. All of these theories were supporting each other, and that is her legacy. And so I wanted to end actually stealing a line from Kelly Jensen from a talk that she gave here uh, last salon, and that is that badass doesn't always look like a swashbuckling adventure. Badass doesn't always look like an action movie. Badass can look like sitting by yourself in a concrete bunker on the far western flank of Copenhagen, Denmark, watching a needle bounce back and forth on a piece of paper. And being able to notice things in the waves that nobody else could see and propose a theory that nobody else could think of. That's badass. Thank you. You see? <laughs> right? Back off.